Good morning, everyone. I believe we are now live and recording. And uh, welcome to day five of the conference. It's been a huge, uh, huge uh, uh, success, I want to say, but it's been a judge because we have one day to go. Um, so, oops, uh, just quickly going to share my screen once again, um, just to I let you know once again. Um, I think I was echoing for a second. Um, never mind. So, of the conference. Um, it's been fantastic so far uh, and it's been very intense. Uh, this day is going to be shorter. I'm sure everyone will appreciate this. Uh, so we have um, uh, about uh, six speakers today. So we'll start from Colin. Uh, Colin is already here with us on stage. He will talk about our code quality. We'll then move to a conversation about Slack. Um, then uh, we will have Health Foundation once again. Uh, Fiona Grimm and Emma Westerson will speak about the open analytics in the Health Foundation and how they responded to COVID-19. Uh, Richard Wilson, Richard was uh, here. I know you attended many sessions, so um, he will speak about mortality dashboard. Uh, Jamie Lee Chapman will talk about <coughs> RQ exams, and also uh, we, we are very, very thrilled to have uh, Financial Times team who will speak about uh, communicating statistics in the age of short attention spans. Uh, we will close our uh, conference, uh, quarter to 12. Uh, it's going to be about half an hour talk. We'll have a mix of speakers for this one, so watch the space. And we will also have social hour. So please join us if you can. I believe everyone should have received uh, Zoom links in the emails yesterday, but if you haven't received it for any reason, please uh, let us know in chat or send us email at nhs.rcommunity at nhs.net. Um, uh, housekeeping as usually, I know everyone already knows Crowdcast and can very freely uh, work with this, but please make sure you uh, participate in the chat, please ask questions and what on the questions. Um, we still have our Twitter, Please join us and please uh, follow us uh, as well. Uh, we have Slack and we will speak about how to use Slack later today. Hexa time, we announced partnership uh, earlier this week. Uh, so please make sure you check it out. And also apparently Zoe told me that today is World Cardinals Day. So please be kind to each other uh, as you won't tolerate any harassment and any offensive language. Um, and again, I'm, I'm going to go very quickly because everyone knows about this. Chat box in the uh, right bottom corner. Uh, we also have ask a question functionality. You also can vote on questions that you like, and you also can move from session to session. Uh, please stay here now in this live session this morning on Friday. Uh, if you want after this uh, session or after morning, if you want to check uh, early presentations, you still can uh, because they're still available on Crowdcast. And after the session finishes, you will be automatically pulled in the next session. But again, uh, you can move uh, as well. And this is all from me for today. So I'm very delighted to introduce to you Colin Gillespie. Uh, so Colin is a uh, uh, co-founder of, uh, or founder, sorry, I'm not so sure, uh, of Jumping Creamers, so he can uh, correct me uh, if I'm wrong. Uh, he's also a lecturer in Newcastle University, and he has uh, been teaching R and I assume using R as well for the last 15 years. Um, so Colin, over to you now. Please feel free to share your screen. Uh, and um, yes, over to you. Thank you very much. I'll share my screen and hopefully that should all work amazingly well. First time. And now we're messing up already. Isn't that great? Right. Good morning. Thank you very much for, for joining us. And I don't know if you've seen or uh, heard Anastasia's little nods. You know, I was asking how much time I have and she mentioned the word short session there and a quick session. And then at the end, we've got a talk in short attention span and how they're looking forward to ending with, with a drink session. So I'm not going to keep you too long this morning. And what I'm going to be talking about this morning is our code quality. And I thought, what better way to thank the organisers for doing such a wonderful job than to change my title at the very last minute just to quality. So apologies for that and all the, the bits and pieces you may, you may choose to update or you might just not bother, which is what I would do. But I'm just going to be talking about quality in general. So a bit about me, so my name's Colin Gillespie, as introduced, and I'm one of the co-founders of Jumping Rivers. So we're based up in Newcastle, and Newcastle is a bit of Scotland that wasn't wanted a few hundred years ago, so it's right next to the border. And I'm one of the, the co-authors of this book that we, we did a couple of years ago. So Jumping Rivers, uh, we're not a water company, although we do lots of work with, with water companies. We do lots of R and Python and data science and AI, and I'll be telling you a bit more about what we do 
as a company as we're going through this talk. So, what are we going to talk about today, or what am I going to talk about today? Well, I'm going to be talking about quality. And most organisations have an idea of style or an idea of quality. So if you do a quick Google, after my talk, obviously, if you do a quick Google for The Guardian Style Guide, you'll come to a page where they've got lots of, of uh, rules and regulations about what they're going to talk about. So they, they, they specify how we should use the phrase, aha, you know, are we talking about Alan Partridge or are we talking about that amazing band from Norway? You know, these things matter. They're telling you about Daleks. Are we talking about your boss or are we talking about Doctor Who? Rather bizarrely, the background image of that, those Daleks is Newcastle, and I don't quite remember seeing them. And it tells you about how to, to use the word data, and statisticians around the world will, will cry into their coffee, you know, where Guardian doesn't seem to like datum, which is what we're all taught at university that we should say. So the Guardian has this style guide, and if the Guardian has standards, that's sort of links to us, well, what should we be doing? You know, most of the people here are, are using data, they're driving policy, they're using that to inform decisions, and if the Guardian are telling people how to spell the word Dalek, what should we have? So we want to know what we should do and how these standards should be enforced. Right? You know, so the Guardian would go through a whole bunch of editors, you know, someone would write a piece and then someone would go through and make sure it all follows. So here's my thoughts and rules. All right, I've got some thoughts. My first thought is it shouldn't be silly. Now, I realise you work for the NHS and as a large government organisation, you wouldn't have any silly rules whatsoever. You know, they'll all be completely well thought out. But occasionally in organisations, you get some silly rules. And rules just shouldn't be silly, right? They should be defendable. They should be there for a reason. They should be helping people with their job, right? And if they're not silly, that should mean they should be followed, right? So if we've all agreed that we have a bunch of rules that aren't silly, that are there for a purpose, they're there for a reason, then they should be followed. And if they should be followed, then they should be enforced. And by enforced, I don't mean that we're going to come round and shout at someone saying, why haven't you done this? I mean that we're going to make it easy for these things to happen. All right? We're going to stop people breaking them, but we're also going to give them the tools that they just happen naturally, whether that's the computer magically does something for them, but they should be forced. Right? We shouldn't have rules that are just there that everyone knows to ignore. Right? They're either there and we follow and enforce them, or we don't. So at Jumping Rivers, we do lots of training. So this is actually an old diagram. And this is some of the R training courses that we do. Okay, so we do courses for a whole bunch of organizations and we've taught uh, perhaps a number of people who are listening to this talk. So on the left, we've got introduction to R and then they follow all the way through. So on the left is sort of the more foundational courses. And then on the right, we have things like Docker and Plumber. So quite technical things, big data, spatial analysis. We've got Shiny, we've got SQL, machine learning. STAN, so STAN is Bayesian Hierarchical Modeling. So we've got quite a wide variety of courses and we're wanting a nice way of making uh, all this fit together. We're wanting the standards across all these courses. And we also have similar diagrams for things like Python as well, right? So we've got lots of courses. So this is our introduction to ARM course, right? So we've got the front cover and then we've got a chapter two and you can sort of look at that and think, well, I know what you've done there. You've got a bit of R markdown, right? You've got some R markdown and you've made it, put a nice font in, probably stuck it in Git because that's what all the cool kids use. You know, you can't be cool if you're not using Git, so you're probably using Git and that's pretty much it. And you know, look, you've got a lot of chaps in ggplot too and it looks quite nice. But well, once you do the introduction to R, things don't really change, do they? You know, you've got your course, you read it, you make it better, that's it, all finished. Well, this is an evolving document, right? So even though this is sort of the foundational R course, right? And if you look, you know, in that chapter two, it was literally telling you the first thing we tell people was how to do five plus five, right? You know, so it's not really got, it's not got sort of amazing new material, you know, it's the foundation course, 
But this is still an evolving document. Right? And this document is updated, this course is updated on average every three weeks. Right? So every three weeks, one of the team is changing something. And sometimes it might just be, oh, there's a comma in the wrong place. Other times it might be one of the examples wasn't very good, so we're updating that. And other times is we're actually doing sort of a major overhaul and rearranging things and updating practicals. So every time we do a course and someone asks a question, we think, well, was that a good question that should actually be in the course so we don't get that question the next time? Right? You know, we, if we're getting the same questions after every course, then we're doing it wrong, to be honest. You know, we should be answering those questions so people don't have to answer them. So we're constantly updating this document. And if you were to compare the course from three years ago with today, they're about 60 to 70% different. If you were to compare this course with the one from 2014, they're almost completely unique, right? The front cover is the same, but after that, things have changed. So it's an evolving document. And this is major knock-on effects, right? So every time we change introduction to R, that might have a knock-on effect to all the courses down this pipeline. Right? You know, we can't just say, well, we'll drop ggplot2 from intro to R, doesn't matter. Well, that then means we have to figure out what's going on. And so then that sort of leads to a whole cascade of changes that's going down this route. And we're, we're wanting to make things easy to fix as well. Right? So, We've got the, in one side, you make a change, it could have major implications. And on another, we're wanting, if someone spots a typo, we want it easy to, to fix. You know, we want to actually sort of, you know, you've got a comma, please fix it. We also want to provide easy access for licensees. So we are, so lots of people around the world are now using a course material for their own, own training. And we're wanting a way of, look, you have a, one of our course, you follow this step, a single step, and it works for everything, right? We're wanting that to be straightforward, right? So we're wanting a very unified way of accessing this material. And we do have some requirements, right? So all of our notes must have the same feel, right? So if you're doing our markdown or, or doing sort of a report, you, you have that idea, they all must have the same feel. We all want them to build with a single command and we want them to work with a whole variety of technology. So we want the same process with intro to R to be the same with our Docker course, our Git course, our TensorFlow course, our Python course. All these things must be the same, right? Otherwise, it's just a pain. So here's some of the Jumping Rivers team, right? So Jumping Rivers. And listening to the talks, you know, some people have been starting the talk saying what a wonderful team they've got, you know, how amazing everything they are and how it's all been a group uh, team effort. And I'm a little bit embarrassed here. I don't trust any of these folk whatsoever, right? You know, it's just, I, I admit it, I just don't trust them. And especially this bloke here, right? This bloke here, he's been programming for 20 years. He makes mistakes every single week he does stupid things like make changes on friday at eight o'clock at night and then switch off the computer he doesn't always think things through he's constantly making errors just in case you're wondering that's me right i'm not just slagging off some random person in the company but i'm constantly making mistakes i'm constantly doing things wrong and if i'm doing that then i can't really expect everyone else to be better Right, you know, we're all human. We 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 have we make these mistakes. So, what's the solution to the Gillespie problem? Right, you know, we need a solution. So, a style guide. Right. So, I've heard a few people talking about style guides, and that's great. You know, you've got a nice document where you give a detail, a bit like the Guardian and Observer Guide, a detailed list of you know this is what you should do and this is how you should do it. And there's only one tiny little snag with that. I wrote one and I managed not to read it, right? You know, if I can actually write the document and simultaneously not read said document, I'm not really holding it much hope for everyone else, right? You know, who reads the style guide? Let's be honest. And if you do read the style guide, who actually ever updates the style guide, right? No one updates the style guide. It's done and then forgotten about because that's, you know, your time over. 
templates, so that's another good idea. And that's, that's part of the solution that we use. So, temp, you know, people use the same template and then they can start sort of having the same workflow. But then you're sort of thinking, well, who's going to update the template? If I update the template, how do I get that template pushed throughout everyone using it? How do I make that work? How do I make sure they use the template in the first place? Right. So again, you know, it's how do we make these changes happen? And then employing clever people is also a good one. And we've tried that, and they're the problem, to be perfectly honest. They right? employ really clever people, and they, they find edge cases. They want to use the latest and greatest technology. They come up with ideas I've never heard of, and they do all this amazing stuff, and they're causing problems all the time, right? And uh, it's a pain. So the solution to all problems in R is to use a package. That's sort of the general solution, right? So if you don't know anything about R and you just want to appear quite clever, just say you should use a package and you'll, you'll come across quite clever. You know, that's all you need to say. Oh, R package, that solves that. You should then walk away in case people ask questions. So I'm going to do a live demo, and this is potentially problematic because live demos are just scary. So I'm just going to, what I'm going to do is I can't type this morning. So I'm going to go into our directory with our notes, right? So there's a, a repo, so these are all the notes I've checked out. So these are all like our notes. And I've got a whole bunch of notes for Python as well. So I can go into our Python uh, introduction to our notes. And every single course that we have has a whole bunch of standard files, right? So for example, we've got, a, we actually enforce what's in the git ignore. So it's a git repo, and every single course that we have has a standard git ignore file, right? And if anyone changes this file, the computer shouts at them and tells them they're not allowed to, right? So every course has exactly the same. And that stops us of adding silly files like the logo or uh, a robot picture, right? So anything that can be templated, anything that can be standardized is standardized, right? Every single file has exactly the same uh, sort of front cover, right? So here we've got an R markdown document. This file is automatically generated. Do not edit. That's a polite way of saying if you edit it, the computer is going to just clobber it and change it back, right? So people aren't allowed to change this, right? Now, if they want to change it, that's fine, but we need to figure out a way of, well, how do we make, you know, why do you want to change it? What's going to happen? Every single course, regardless if it's R, Python, Docker, if you go into that directory, type the word make, uh, and I should, I'm just going to clean all the rubbish so you can see what's happening. Live demo too. If you type the word make, it automatically runs exactly the same script. What's happening just now is it's building that R markdown document. We, we do one or two clever things in, in the background, so it builds it in parallel. And it's checking a few things like packages. It builds a PDF. So regardless of what course you've got, you just get a repo, you type the word make, and it will build it regardless of if it's R, Python, Docker, it just does it all in Markdown. It figures out the configuration. Right. So you've got a very standardized way of, of building it, right? Every single course we have is you type the same command and the same thing happens. Hurry up. Come on. I'm waiting for this to finish. Ah, I think it's gone. My computer's been a bit slow. I think something's running in the background. Sorry. So it's now doing all the usual Markdown things. And then on top of that, so that's the build process. So that will produce a nice PDF, okay? And I have no idea why this is so slow today. Come on. Right. And there's also another command called make final. And then this produces a whole bunch of checks, right? So that's sort of guarding style guide. We've got the same style guide uh, inside Jumping Rivers. And I'll, I'll sort of take you through some of the stuff that it's sort of going through. Right. So the first step is, is it up to date with master? So has someone made a sneaky change in the repo and just forgot to pull? So it checks that, that's annoying. Then it checks all, checks all these template files. So it makes sure that the, the, the template files is, are the same. It does things like check spelling. Right. It checks whether or not the, the, the chapter titles are using title case. So here that should be a capital S. If that was a lowercase s, the computer would raise an error. Do all the sections have section case? So it runs through all that. Checks all the URLs. Uh, checks for full stops at the end of table captions. 
checks for citations, labels, references, uh, checks code style, so it runs linter and all the different bits of code chunks we've got in our notes. People really love that. Uh, it checks live scripts, so when we're doing training online, it checks for live scripts, and then it produces some output. So it's got all these different things. Is that Anastasia telling me I've gone on far too long? No, I'm just moving from session to session. Okay. So it does all these checks, right? And anything that is not changed, it will show us. And then do I really trust people to be able to type that command on the laptop? Well, no, I don't. I don't trust myself. I still do silly things such as make a little change and go, yeah, that's bound to work, and then I'll push it. So what we've then got, we've got continuous integration. So continuous integration means you push a change to the big computer in the sky, and then a whole bunch of checks run. And those are the checks you've just seen me type in the laptop. So each course is a course package. So it'll first of all, check the course package. Then it will check the live, so that's a sort of a demo script. It will check the notes directory, that's the ones that you've just seen. And then it does something similar for slides. If and only if all those things pass with a nice big tick, would people be allowed to merge into master? Right. And then we've also got a little few other things of that automatically creates a Docker uh, image for training. So we've got a, an image that's been created based only on what our notes were built on. So we're sure of all the dependencies. And we've also got auto tagging. So again, we had it in a style guide that you should tag all notes uh, after you change something. Would you believe that no one ever did this because we just forgot? So now, well, we make it happen by magic. And once this is set up, your team will love you, right? The, the praise and adoration that you'll get from your team is, is endless. Uh, well, sometimes. So here's Jamie complaining about how long it took because he's building stuff in TensorFlow, but that's just Jamie. Uh, Seb, which is a channel for complaining about calling CI checks? Well, what does Seb know? Theo, oh, who disallowed pushing to master for the Tidyverse 2 repo? This is not what I need right now. Okay, then. Uh, well, it turns out that this is also an evolving and ongoing process. Right? You know, we're doing lots of sort of courses that are generally quite cutting edge. And in order for this to work, when someone has a, a query, you know, for each of these queries, we had to sit down and think, well, why did this arise and how can we fix it, right? Not just go, well, you're doing it wrong. So for, for Jamie's stuff, he was doing, I think it was a TensorFlow course and he was doing sort of lots of computation. So how do we get that to speed up? You know, if he's having to wait some for 15 minutes for the CI to work, then that's not good enough. So we spent some time optimizing that, so it's not a bottleneck. Theo, well, he was starting a new course, and his point was, well, I just felt like writing some stuff, and I just wanted to start writing and not mess about. And that's perfectly reasonable. So now we're thinking about how do we combine that of you want to get some stuff done, while at the same time putting in some CI but not hindering it, and that's what we're thinking about now. But it's an evolving and ongoing process. So final slide. Uh, you want to enforce standards. So I hate standards that aren't enforced. So if they're there, they should be followed. How do you update? Whatever we do, we have to assume that it's wrong. So whatever file, whatever template, whatever style you've got in place, it may change in the future. How do you do you update that with people? How do you change that? There's always going to be edge cases. You know, so some of the edge cases we dealt with were, well, some of our courses don't have notes. So then you need that, well, what happens if you don't have notes? That's okay. Uh, how do you do that? So thank you very much for your time. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you're interested in training a consultant, please just drop me an email and I look forward to any questions you might have. Thanks. That's great. Uh, Colin, thank you. Can you hear me all right, Colin? Yes, fine, loud and clear. That's, that's lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, and um, we do have some people asking about the training. So um, perhaps uh, if, if, can you put your email into the chat? Yep. Uh, oh, I, I don't have it at hand, Colin. But so, Colin, just while we're doing that, um, somebody else has asked a question about: um, Are you using our kind of S three generic functions in your course packages? Sometimes yes, and sometimes no. Uh, so you typically no, and the reason for that is when we're writing. Functions. So for that that checking statement, the package is actually really simple. 
essentially, you know, each each check is a file called checks check X. And again, we're just wanting people to go into that and change something and update something without having to be able to know about S3 functions. Okay. So it's a sort of a conscious decision of getting the barrier down that anyone can sort of fix anything because I don't want to be stuck with fixing all this stuff. So we're trying to sort of lower the barrier for allowing people to sort of tweak that. Uh, so yeah, in general, we don't need S3 functions because it's just very much a, a check. Just, um, kind of, do you mind if I ask, uh, obviously what you're showing us is a very sophisticated workflow um, and you make it sound really easy, but it didn't, it didn't kind of just happen. So whose vision was this, Colin? Because it's vision. an unusual workflow. <laughs> I like your optimism, Mohammed. Uh, that, that was a, that's very nice. Uh, it evolved, uh, and it evolved essentially because I suppose I started by doing one or two courses. But it started by we were doing courses for clients, and you were going to a bank, and they want to say, "Well, can you give me a list of our packages that we need?" And so essentially, it was well, actually, if you install this one course package that will get all the dependencies okay and so once you go down that route then how do you build your notes well you want to set up an environment where you only have this one course package because that's what you're telling your client to do yeah uh, and when we started enforcing this stuff you know one of the things we forgot from our shiny course was shiny dashboard we just forgot to add it as a dependency and but once you sort of start getting the computer who is not quite as clever you need to be very explicit so yeah, okay that's where it came from. Thank you. Colin, that's great. Look, thank you for keeping to time as well. I, I, it's me that's run over a little bit. So look, uh, a lot of lots of rounds of applause, of course, as usual. And Colin has starred in most of our conferences, actually. So a big thank you, Colin. And also thank you to Jumping Rivers, who always support the conference with, with workshops as well, really. Um, great. Uh, so if colleagues can uh, try and either move to the next session by going to the top left-hand corner of your screen, uh, take us to uh, the 940 session, please. And I'll see you there in a short while. Thank you very much, everyone. See you soon. Thank you.